Welcome back, everybody. As you might have noticed, in our past few lectures, we've been focusing our attention on a branch of psychology that we call cognitive psychology. Most of our discussions have focused on some of the key elements that allow us to really take what we are experiencing from the world and make sense of it. We also, in our last class, started talking a little bit about differences that emerge and things that allow for these cognitive activities to be a little bit easier for some. Well, this was one path that people started to take as we started to undergo a uh, kind of understanding or an attempt to understand how our cognitive world worked. But another path that was taken at about the exact same time was one that didn't necessarily try to understand differences between individuals, but how a lot of these cognitive skills that we sort of take for granted as adults come about. And this leads us to the work of a very famous historical figure in psychology, a gentleman named Jean Piaget. And what we're going to be doing in today's lecture is looking at Piaget's work, some of the concepts that he introduced, and from that, build an understanding of a new branch of psychology that started to form in the early 1900s, one that we call developmental psychology. To understand why Piaget was such a large contributor to the development of the field of developmental psychology, and to be fair, psychology as a whole, we have to first understand some context around where Piaget came from and some of the things that were occurring when he came into the forefront of this new branch of psychology that we again nowadays call developmental psych. Piaget was born in 1896. Uh, he was a very famous Swiss researcher in the early 1900s working with numerous individuals to try to improve upon the intelligence tests that had been developed by Alfred Binet and some of his later predecessors who were trying to constantly refine the questions and content within the intelligence tests that were circulating across the world as Piaget started to do his work. And what Piaget wanted to focus on in his aspect of the work was how subtle differences uh, emerged within kids in terms of the, the kind of skills that they might develop at different points. But what he kept running into when trying to find some of these subtle differences was that there seemed to be almost an underlying theme to most children as they took these tests where they would get certain questions wrong, but not just randomly wrong wasn't that they didn't have enough information. It was, it was simply, they seemed to be perceiving the questions in very different ways. And this led Piaget to this aha moment where he started to question whether or not children were really seeing the world the same way as adults. And more importantly, he started to question whether or not there wasn't some real set <coughs> path that most of us maybe went down when developing from infant to adulthood that could be maybe mapped out or at least given names. And to test this idea, this inkling, he started doing a number of studies with his three children that you see pictured here, Laurent, Lucien, and Jacqueline, looking at some of the things that they were able to do at different points in their life, looking at some of the things they couldn't actually do at different points, and using that to be a catalyst to studying large numbers of children and trying to understand if there was kind of a universal unfolding that was happening in the minds of children. Eventually, through his work with children, Piaget went on to conclude that not only did children not see the world the same way as adults, but they were essentially undergoing this quest from infancy into adulthood to try to piece together some whittling of an understanding of how all the components to the world around them worked. Now, mind you, when we're talking about how children grow to understand the world, Piaget's focus was not on things like stereotypes and, and of beliefs and attitudes that we form. That's a separate topic. Piaget's focus were on those cognitive components that we talked about earlier. 
how memory works, how things in the world exist around us. These were the big <coughs> ideas that Piaget's work focused on. And what he contended when looking at the children that he was testing was that all of us are sort of born little experimenters. We have this desire to understand all the things around us and how they're functioning, how they're working. But we're not born with this innate set of skills that allow us to just magically figure it out. Instead, we have to undergo this tinkering process where we devise our own ideas of how the world works. And these ideas are often imperfect, so we're constantly adapting, changing them to try to master our environment better and be able to predict all the things that are going on around us. Some of you might ask how we do this. What is it that allows us to go through this process? Um, Piaget's ideas, there were some very concrete terms and things that, that were key elements to all of us developing from infancy into adulthood. The big thing that Piaget's work focused on was this idea of something that we call schemas. Frameworks or ideas that we develop to better understand the world around us. Now, this concept was originally a developmental psych concept, but it did bleed into a large number of other areas of psychology as the field progressed. Social psychologists, clinical psychologists, even personality psychologists use the word schemas often to better understand how it is that individuals make sense of the world around them and how they interpret the things that they're encountering. For Piaget's work, schemas were just these mental frameworks that kids are constantly tinkering with, working on, so they can better understand big picture ideas and cognitive aspects of the world around us. And as I mentioned before, Piaget's contention was that when we are young, we're trying to form lots of schemas, but these schemas are often incomplete or just incorrect. And this can lead to a state of mind that we call disequilibrium. He said when a scheme is predicting the world around us, everything's great, well, then we're in this state of mind called equilibrium, and there's no need to adjust or adapt to these new encounters that we're running into. But if we say do recognize a moment through some encounter that our scheme is not working, it isn't perfect or lacking, then this disequilibrium occurs, and we're really forced to try to find a way to dispel the discomfort that this disequilibrium causes. One of the things that we can do is find ways to kind of embed the new information that we're encountering into our existing schema. Maybe by giving an explanation for something that, that kind of does away with the conflict, or by potentially uh, just kind of forgetting or pretending that that thing that we're encountering never really happened. If we do decide, though, that our schema is incomplete or definitely needs to be corrected, then we can undergo this process that we call accommodation, where we alter the schema, update it essentially, to try to find a way to better explain these conflicting things that we're encountering. And if we do correctly, we get back to that state of mind called equilibrium, and the process of getting back to it was something he called equilibration. So let me provide an example of what we'd be looking at here. Let's say you're a two-year-old child and you've been in a relatively sheltered life, so you've never seen one of these things. But you go over to a friend's house, start playing, and as you're playing with this friend's house, this thing comes bounding out and starts jumping on you and licking you and trying to play with you. So you decide, I need to figure out what this is. I need to ask my parents for one of these things. I need to form a schema of what makes this thing what it is. So you ask your friend what's its name and your friend says doggy. So you immediately start trying to piece together what makes a doggy a doggy. You come to the conclusion that maybe having hair makes a doggy a doggy or having floppy ears makes a doggy a doggy or having four legs makes a doggy a doggy or maybe the tail's the big thing or maybe it's all these things packaged together. And in essence, what you do by the time you're done playing with that doggy is 
have some sort of working schema of what makes a doggy a doggy. And this schema can sometimes help us navigate in future situations. So let's say you go to a pet store and you point at something with the fur and tail and everything and you say doggy and your parents say, yeah, that, that's a doggy. Maybe you start pestering them more and more about needing a doggy or wanting a doggy. And then let's say you go to a different friend's house. And instead of this doggy bouncing out, this doggy comes bounding out around the corner. You see the floppy ears, you see the tail, you see the playfulness, you see the hair, and you immediately decide, must be another doggy. So you call it a doggy, and all of a sudden, people start correcting you. You maybe go to the store a little bit later and point to a different thing that you thought was a doggy that looks a lot like this new thing, and your parents say, no, it's not a doggy, that, that's, that's a different thing. Maybe you're even told, well, that's a kitty. Well, this could theoretically create some state of mind that, again, we call disequilibrium. You could potentially assimilate the first couple of times, thinking that maybe they thought you were talking about the face, or maybe you thought they were giving this particular doggy a name and they called it kitty, and maybe you weren't allowed to have this one because somebody named it kitty. Uh, lots of things could happen when we assimilate and keep our schema. But if you keep encountering conflicts and people keep pointing out that these are not the same thing, according to Piaget, we'd start to accommodate. We'd start to alter our schema and find ways to better differentiate between the picture on the left and the picture on the right. His contention is that you've all done this. I'm guessing there's nobody in the class that thinks of these two things as the same animal. But for you to be able to do that, you've theoretically found a way to separate these out. And in fact, some cognitive psychologists, which is kind of cool, have tried to parse out all the things that you as adults do to separate these out. Because it's, it's almost implicit by the time we reach adulthood. But this change, this process we grow through, is what, what, what Piaget said is the heart of schemas and the heart of cognitive development. Now, mind you, when we talk about this process of equilibration and understanding the world around us, we're not usually focusing on what's the difference between a dog and a cat. Piaget's ideas were on bigger conceptual things that kids had to learn to understand major critical elements to the world around us. He sort of surmised that all those little things that we maybe need to understand as well about differences between groups and items, well, that, that's more of an experience-based thing. But he contended that for the big things that we need to learn, the big picture ideas that need to be understood so we can appreciate how the world around us functions, and he thought those things were learned in a very predictable pattern. Not only were they learned in a predictable pattern, but there were subcomponents within these ideas that had to be mastered before we could transition from learning one step along the way to another. So his job, or his task, I guess, after he started talking about this unfolding process, was to lay out a map for how we progressed from infants to adults and the steps along the way that allowed us to kind of see things in different light. But he contended that all of us had to go through this process, had to, to kind of alter our thinking around the world. Now, it's probably important to note here that when we talk about his map and some of the things that he discussed, his focus was on what he called normal children. Nowadays, we'd call it neurotypical children, how they grow to understand the world around them. There's always exceptions to this that he would, would kind of argue, would kind of throw off things. His argument was if, that if your mind functioned the way most children around your age function, that you should progress naturally through these developmental stages that he eventually called the cognitive stages of development. What were these cognitive stages of development? Um, his insistence was that when looking at the children he studied, most of us seem to go through four major changes before we tend to think the same way as most adults. Again, I need to reiterate that when I say we think the same way as most adults, it doesn't mean that we have the same opinions or the same attitudes. I'm sure many of us are encountering a large number of people in our lives right now that 
hold very different opinions and attitudes about specific elements of things. But if we're looking just at our cognitive functioning, our ability to understand things like well, gravity or object permanence or other things we're going to be talking about here, and we all have kind of a collective understanding of these things. There, there's not a huge difference from one person to another on those big picture items. And Piaget's contention was that it took us four steps before we actually saw the, the elements of the world around us in the same way. The first stage he said we're in when we're born is something he called the sensory motor stage, where, as the name kind of implies, we're developing lots of sensory skills and motor skills, understanding essentially how those tools we've been talking about before in previous classes work. After we master those things and a couple other new elements that we'll talk about a little bit later, we move on to something called the pre-operational stage. Somewhere around one and a half to two years of age, we start into this stage and start to develop the first components of what he called operations, kind of mental ways of interpreting and understanding the world around us. We'll get into those a little bit later as we progress, but you know, before we do that, I want to also point out that there are two other stages. It's called the concrete operational stage, where we get into much more complex things, and the formal operational stage, where we get into more hypothetical, conceptual ideas that our minds and brains are able to digest for the very first time because of some of the earlier tools that we develop. For the remainder of this class, we're going to spend a lot of time focusing on the specific stages that Piaget laid out. And then at the very end, we'll talk about some critique and kind of updates to this theory that people added when we wanted to, to get a better, more comprehensive understanding of how cognitive development worked and then kind of build from that to understand how developmental psychology formed after the work of Piaget. But let's first, again, dive in to some of the key elements of these different stages that Piaget proposed. So let's take a closer look at this first stage of development that we call the sensory motor stage. As I mentioned earlier, the main focus for children developing during this stage is to find a way to make sense of this information that's coming from our sensory organs and also to find a way to coordinate reactions to this. If this were a lifespan development course, we'd be talking about these things called primary, secondary, and tertiary reactions, uh, looking at kind of this progression of our ability to further implement and understand the world around us, and then gain a greater understanding of how to react to those things we find in our environment. There's lots of debates in our current field of cognitive development about what really allows for these skills to develop. Uh, some that argue it's an innate thing that just happens at specific milestones, and others that focus on the social components to it, and maybe the desires that prompt the development of a lot of skills. But if we're looking at other things that are part of this sensory motor stage, it's important to note that we go beyond just learning those two components, our sensory skills and motor skills, during the first year and a half to two years of our life. Two other really critical elements to the sensory motor stage that Piaget detailed was the ability to understand something called object permanence and the first formations of this thing that he called a sense of self. Object permanence was this idea that things continue to exist and retain their properties even when unseen. His classic test that he'd do to determine if kids understood object permanence was to place a toy or something undesirable in front of them and then cover that toy or block that toy from their view, seeing how the children would react. He contended that at about one year of age, kids started to display some understanding of object permanence by trying for the very first time to reach around the thing that was blocking their view or maybe reach under the thing that was covering what it was they were looking at. And his implication was that this was maybe the first inklings of them understanding object permanence. Now, current researchers have rejected this notion that it takes until about a year for children to develop this. In fact, some studies have suggested that kids might be able to understand this idea as young as two or three months of age. But nonetheless, it does potentially give us a 
big insight into some of the struggles that children undergo at very young ages when, say, parents disappear or something they want isn't in sight. That idea that something's not just missing but gone from existence would be chilling to all of us if that was the way we understood the world. And if we do start to develop it, even at two or three months, there's still lots of questions as to how strong an understanding of this is until we do get to about a year of age. Something that coincidingly is happening at this time is we're learning to kind of understand that we're a part of this world around us. Now, there's other elements developing this sense of self that we talked about. Uh, and, and we will look in it a little bit later when we get to adolescence and, and kind of a new definition of who we are. But this early inkling of a sense of self is this notion that we start to recognize that people can see us, that they can interact with us, and that there's essentially an us that's there. Uh, the classic test that he developed was this thing called the Rouge test, where he would paint rouge or red on the noses of children, having them look into mirrors and seeing how they would react, suggesting that if they reacted to the red that was on the noses of the individual in the mirror and trying to kind of touch it or see it closer, it suggested that maybe they didn't recognize their own reflection and in turn hadn't really developed that sense of self. Again, he insisted it was about a year to year and a half before kids start to master this. And when they've gotten it, along with some of the sensory motor skills that we talked about earlier, well, then it's time for them to progress to the next stage of development. Now, as children reach about age two, Piaget contended that they started to progress into something that we call the pre-operational stage. It was this transition from just being able to control our body and understand the world around us to really trying to understand some of the cognitive elements of the world. The term operations is a real key element to this next process that many kids go through, at least according to Piaget and other cognitive psychologists that have looked at this closer. One of the operations that kids start to develop is the ability to kind of overcome this thing that we call egocentric thinking that is formed in the early years of life. Egocentric thinking is this belief that what we know, what we see, what we experience is identical to that of everybody else around us. We don't have the ability when we're a year and a half to two years to recognize that if we encountered something when, when nobody was around us, then not everybody knows that thing that we encountered. And if we're, say, looking at something from some angle, it doesn't mean that everybody's looking at it from the exact same angle as us. Now, Piaget thought that somewhere around two and a half to three, kids start to develop indications that they're overcoming this egocentric thought. One of the classic tests that he devised to look at whether or not kids were transitioning was this thing that he called the model of mountains test. Right? He'd seat a child in front of a diorama of different mountains, and he'd ask them to sit in, say, spot A, where the diorama that you see pictured on the bottom left is what they saw. He'd then tell them, let's pretend you have a friend that's going to come into the room and sit over in, we'll say, spot D. What is it that friend is going to see? He wouldn't obviously assume that the kids could identify the letters and the numbers. In fact, they wouldn't have been there. He would just show the four pictures that you see pictured in the lower right-hand corner and again ask the kids what this friend sitting in spot D would see. And what he argued and what he found in numerous studies was that most kids at around two or three would instantly point to photo one and not think twice about it showing that they really were unable to get past that egocentric thinking that was a part of our early childhood. But as they got through this pre-operational stage, as they progressed from three into four-ish, they started to recognize that there was some folly in that assumption. Now, oftentimes, these abilities to overcome egocentric thinking was not something that just randomly snapped in our heads and we were good at it. So he suggested that many children would just start guessing once they realized that what the other person was seeing was not the same as what they'd see. 
But eventually, he said, they developed the skills to recognize that that person sitting in spot D would see the fourth photo. This was, again, an indication that not only did we recognize that others saw things that we didn't see, but others knew things that we didn't see. So some would test egocentric thinking with memory tests. Others would look at it in terms of storytelling and, and of seeing what kids could identify one character knew and another didn't. And it does, if we're being fair to Piaget, seem like many kids do seem to have to overcome this particular type of thinking that probably developed during the sensory motor stage. Eventually, in this pre-operational stage, for most children, uh, we do get past the point of having this type of thinking occur. Maybe we're not perfect at it, but we get a little bit better as we progress. Another thing that we're doing as we're becoming more flexible in our thinking is learning how to pretend things are the way they are. A classic example of this is actually depicted in the upper left-hand corner where you see two sisters having a tea party. If you look closely, you'll see that the older sister, who's probably around three to three and a half, seems to understand intuitively what's going on in this event. She's holding her cake in a rather dainty way with her thumb through the, the, the thumb holder of her teacup, and she seems like she's enjoying herself for the most part. If you look at her sister, you see a very different reaction. You see a vice grip that she's put on the cupcake that she's holding. You see her cup all mangled and bent, and it almost looks like there's a bite out of it. And you can almost feel the frustration emanating from her. Because in her mind, she's probably getting very upset and unsure of why her sister keeps talking about how the cakes are so good and how the tea is so tasty when she doesn't seem to be getting any tea poured in her cup over and over again. Now, Piaget suggested that kids really couldn't even come close to fathoming this until around three or four years of age, but some research has suggested that this girl, this young girl who's probably about a year and a half to two, is probably on track to developing this. She just hasn't mastered it in the same way that her older sibling has. And again, this is something that we theoretically are working on in this pre-operational stage. But if we're looking at the thing that dominates this stage, much like we had our sensory and motor systems dominating the first stage, the thing that's really prominent in this pre-operational stage is our development of this thing that we call symbolism, our ability to understand that certain things represent others. This is sort of what pretend play is all about, but usually when we talk about symbolism, we're talking about development of vocabulary, our ability to understand the, the words that go with specific things. Numerous studies have shown that children between the ages of two and around seven undergo this insane vocabulary growth spurt, regardless of the language that they're speaking. In fact, many models have struggled to quantify how something like this is even possible when we see kids going through stretches for a few years of their life where they learn somewhere between seven and 10 words a day, something that, that's just unfathomable for most models. This, I, I guess, odd effect suggests that if we're looking at the main cognitive growth that kids are undergoing at this age, processing symbols is a big thing that a lot of our cognitive resources are dedicated to. And it, it does eventually result in some very robust growth in vocabulary and also better comprehension of the conversations that kids are engaged in to where you transition by the age of two to just saying a few words to being able to have full conversations by four or five and actually being able to engage in adult-like conversations by the time we reach the end of this pre-operational stage. It's important to note, though, that there was, according to Biaget, one last thing that we needed to learn at the end of this pre-operational stage. This last thing that Piaget contended we learn at the end of the pre-operational stage, right before we reach the next stage called the concrete operational stage, is this idea of something called conservation. It's our ability to for the very first time, uh, start to understand the properties of some of the things around us. 
We start to understand things like quantity and volume and all these complex ideas that can help us think in a much more abstract and, and broader, almost more scientific way. The classic test that Piaget used to determine if kids were just getting an inkling of the idea of conservation is actually depicted in the two images that you see in front of you. If you look at the picture on the left, you see a researcher asking a child with two beakers filled equally in front of them, which beaker contains more fluid, the one on the left, the one on the right, or do they have the exact same amount? And almost all children at every age, once they understand what the question is about, will start by saying that they have the same amount. And then in the second picture that you see on the right, you see the researcher flipped one of the beakers. It doesn't mean that anything was poured out. It doesn't mean that anything was added. Just one of the beakers was flipped over. And then that researcher asks the child the same question. Which one has more? The one on the left, the one on the right, or they're equal? And what Piaget and others tend to find is that most children at around, I'm guessing this kid's about four-ish, uh, around age four, tend to indicate that the one that's higher is the one that contains more fluid all of a sudden, even though that same child had just indicated that they were the same. Other examples of conservation include when you, say, give a child a piece of food and then cut it up, they insist that that thing that's been spread out and cut up somehow contains more of whatever you've given them, despite the fact that you didn't really add or subtract anything from what's in front of them. There's actually a bunch of charts talking about how we sort of develop tools, tricks to understand quantity in a very imperfect way. And, and essentially what we're doing as we develop these conservation skills is we're doing away with some of those follies, some of those missteps in our attempts to understand very early on the, the quantities of things. Now, if we're looking for some pushback on this idea of conservation, understand that Piaget was a huge advocate that this was maybe the beginning of the next stage of development called the concrete operational stage. Other times he kind of suggested that this was the bridge between the pre-operational and the concrete operational stage. And if we're going by that, you know, one would suggest that most kids at around six or seven still really wouldn't have developed this skill. Most of our current research, especially if we focus on the wording of questions, suggests that kids actually get this idea a little bit earlier. And children as young as five years of age can usually get this question right on a regular basis if the questions are phrased correctly. Now, this, as we're gonna talk about later, might be more of a kind of issue with developing tests than a knock on Piaget and his timelines. But nonetheless, it, it sort of takes this idea of conservation and puts it in a weird spot. Because if it's seen as the transition between the pre-operational stage and concrete operational stage, you know, we can just move it up. But one of the things that Piaget highlighted with this transition is something that's not actually supposed to happen until later on. What is this thing that we're talking about, this thing that allows kids to transition from early operations to what we then call concrete operations? Well, the tool that kids are thought to develop at around age six or seven is this tool called metacognition. The first inklings where you can access your thoughts, your emotions, your, your memories of specific stuff on kind of a volitional basis. Piaget and other cognitive development theorists have contended that many kids at around three, four, five do have memories. They do have attention spans. They have all of these components to mental worlds that we think of as adults, but they don't necessarily have access to those things. They don't realize what it is they're feeling or what thoughts are popping up and how that's dictating some of the things that they're doing. And that makes navigating in our mental world very challenging. But Piaget thought that when kids were developing these conservation skills that we just talked about, they were able to do this because they were finally able to start to develop these metacognitive skills where they could talk to themselves, think about things in different ways, and in doing so, start to solve the problem.
In fact, he gave really great examples of children when they started off with a conservation task, just giving knee-jerk reactions, talking about how the taller beaker was obviously the one that contained more, even though they couldn't understand why, to having a conversation with themselves out loud in front of the researcher, and eventually kind of whispering to themselves, trying to answer the question in their own head, and then coming to this realization that they could actually try to dissect the problem without even having to move their mouths. This, according to Piaget, was an indication that metacognition was starting to form and that kids would start to develop much better memory skills and more complex language skills as this got better and better during the concrete operational stage. Well, there's probably a good chance that, again, his timing was a little bit off with the early formation of the metacognitive skills. But if we're looking at what happens between about ages 7 to 11, it's tough to deny that kids do seem to really be focusing in on this internal mental development that's happening between these ages. We probably do develop a lot of metacognitive skills, and what it allows us to do is work with stuff in much more complex ways than we ever could before. Reading becomes easier, our ability to do math becomes easier, and our ability to essentially do and undo things, what we call operations, becomes something that's sort of obvious, where just a few years ago, or months ago even, these things are challenging. Let's give an example of what I'm talking about with operations. As you see in front of you, there are 10 pennies. You, know, you don't even need to count them, I promise you, there's 10 pennies. Now let's say I took away some of those pennies and asked you how many pennies were in front of you now. Most of us, including most five-year-olds, even a large number of four-year-olds, could answer that there were six pennies in front of you. But if I asked you or a child to close your eyes, told you that I put all the pennies back that I took away, and asked you how many pennies you're going to see when you open your eyes, what we'd find is most four, five, even six-year-olds struggle with that question. They struggle with the ability to undo what had just been done, to remember that there were 10 pennies, and if we're just putting the ones we took away back, that there would be 10 pennies again when they open their eyes. This kind of cognitive flexibility that comes with metacognition requires development. It requires work. It requires a lot of growth in, in, in the kind of flexibility and capacity of our mind. And as that grows, we're able to think about things in different ways. We're able to, to just start in on the inklings of operations that are really a part of the next stage of development, where we can do basic analogies for the first time. A great analogy that is pretty easy for a nine or a 10 year old to master, even though again, a couple years before it would be challenging, is the one you see in front of you. If I said run is to walk as fast as to, it seems pretty probably obvious to a college student that this is obviously equivalent to slow, but for a four year old, a five year old, this probably seems like a random question. You know, they might say really fast, or fast is to walk, or fast is to run. It, it, it seems just random to them. But as they start to understand relationships, they can keep things in their mind, they can have that inner dialogue, fast is to slow starts to emerge as the prominent answer. By the time most of us are at around 11, we do usually have the ability to do these analogies without problem leads us to the very last stage of development, called the formal operational stage, where the highlight, as you see in the upper right hand corner, starts to become abstract reasoning, where our minds can not only just focus on the things that are in front of us, but these hypothetical things that could potentially happen, or maybe we would even want them to happen. A classic example of the development of abstract reasoning is if you ask, say, a nine or 10 year old, what they want to do on a trip, or you know, what would be the best case scenario for today when you go to do blank. Those children would struggle with that question. At best, they could probably just regurgitate what happened the last time they went on a trip, or what happened the last time they went to do something during a day. But as we progress, as we get into this formal operational stage, 
kids can start to postulate what might happen based on a collection of different elements, or maybe even what they'd love to have happen in this situation, thinking about a multitude of possibilities that they might encounter. And this allows kids to start to break down logic problems for the first time and start to recognize the repercussions of their activities. But it's important to note that as we're developing this abstract reasoning, it's not like we go from zero to a hundred without any bumps along the way. Numerous studies have cited that many kids, when they get into their early adolescence, start to imagine best case scenarios and things that might happen, but unfortunately overestimate the likelihood of specific outcomes or underestimate the likelihood of other types of outcomes. A specific term that was introduced by a developmental theorist named David Elkin called adolescent egocentrism really highlighted this weird side effect of kids developing the first moments of abstract reasoning. Elkin surmised that when kids get to around 12, 13, they start to sort of see themselves as invincible. They start to see themselves as the center of the world, almost like they're returning back to the egocentric thinking we had in the sensory motor stage. And they start to see their lives as having some sort of story to it, something he called a personal fable. And he suggested that this combination of things could be very dangerous for young kids because it would lead to us trying to do more dramatic things, risky things, and not thinking about the consequences of our behaviors. Because, well, we're not quite there about being able to really estimate, calculate out what consequences could come about if we do certain things. But Elkin's insistence, and the insistence of Piaget, was that this was more of a temporary fad. That by the time we reached around 15 or beyond, We'd mastered that problem, and we'd all started to think the same way other adults think. As a reminder, it doesn't mean we all agree on everything, or we have the same attitudes about stuff. But in theory, Piaget and Elkin and other developmental theorists that support this idea suggested that at 15, all of us have the same tools that we're using. Our minds are kind of processing information in the same way, even if we do things differently with that information that we're processing. And this really wraps up the general idea of Piaget's, that when we look at children, we're seeing individuals that still need to develop a lot of tools. And as we naturally age, we naturally encounter problems that lead us all to kind of overcoming certain hurdles at pretty much the same time. Piaget's insistence was that this was just something that happened as a byproduct of the world around us. Extra coaching or interventions maybe tweak things a little bit, but never to the point where somebody could be in a completely different place from somebody else. He almost suggested that all of this was kind of biologically innate, even though he never took that extra step. And this was something that many people just embraced at the time, but current researchers have actually brought into question. Many researchers, when trying to replicate Piaget's original studies, or more importantly, refine them to change the wording of questions or change the structure of tests, have found that Piaget's timing and cutoff for when we learn a lot of the concepts that we talked about earlier seem to be off. More and more studies have shown that kids understand conservation and object permanence, especially if we talk about nuances to these things, much earlier than Piaget had surmised. There's also numerous studies that have shown that this idea that all of us get to the same level of thinking by 15 might be kind of folly. There's the belief that a lot of individuals, even their adulthood years, still have not perfected a lot of the abstract thinking, hypothetical thinking that we assume all of us have gotten to by 15. But if we're looking at these issues with Piaget's, we do have to appreciate the fact that he had nothing to go off of. Right? He created this whole elaborate scheme of how we developed mentally and the things that we were developing out of thin air. There wasn't a lot to be built off of. So yes, some of his tests were extremely imperfect. 
Yes, his timing was probably off, and we could talk about his insistence that this was innate as being just kind of stubborn, but it's probably important that we don't throw out all of Piaget's work or denounce some of the things that he did simply because he got his numbers wrong. But if we are looking for kind of a counter to Piaget, it's usually based on those issues that we talked about earlier with timing and kind of differences emerging. And we talked about how most of his research focused on what he called normal or we might call neurotypical development. It's something that not only is, is kind of problematic when we look at large samples of the population, but it's also something that doesn't really sit well with data. When we go across different cultures, when we look at individuals that are pushed in different dimensions or people that don't have much stimulation, we see that these numbers can be shifted pretty dramatically to where we're not all at pretty much the same place when we are specific ages. If we're looking for how we can explain this, Piaget's theory doesn't provide us with much tool, much of a tool to do. Instead, what we often lean on is the work of another theorist named Lev Vygotsky, who pretty much at the same time as Piaget was focusing his attention on how these cognitive skills that we'd started studying in psychology were coming about. Vygotsky, though, didn't insist that he wanted to create a roadmap for how we went through things. He just wanted to focus his attention on the process, how we were able to sort of make sense of stuff and, and how this process could vary from individual to individual. To discuss this, he introduced some very important terminology that we still use today in cognitive development research and also educational studies. One term that he talked about that made him very popular is this idea of something called a zone of proximal development. This sort of phase when a child was able to master some of the cognitive skills that we talked about earlier with Piaget, but not necessarily master them on their own. Maybe master them through the help or aid of certain people or things. And if we're talking about what could speed up a child when they got into this zone, there was another term he used called scaffolding, where we try to get somebody to understand a concept by sort of challenging their thinking. And in doing this, we, we teach them about something at a level slightly above their own. Say, for example, we want a child to understand conservation. So we have them interact not with a teacher that understands things well, but a child that maybe just got over their conservation problems. We have them give the other child a test, and through their slightly different wording, through their way of explaining it, that might help the younger child who's in that zone master that idea all the faster. Now, this might lead you to question whether or not we should accept any of Piaget's ideas, or whether or not you know Piaget had it all wrong and we should just fully support Vygotsky's, whose idea was maybe too simplistic. It's not where I want you to go with this. What I want you to get from what we've covered here is that developmental psychology was a very broad reaching field, even in its early stages. And it continued to grow as the work of Piaget and Vygotsky started to be dissected and people started to find their own niches that they could explore. And that's where we're gonna go after talking about this. We're going to look at what developmental psychology is all about, and we'll also explore some of the other theorists and work that was done to really expand upon some of these early ideas of Piaget. But for today, I think we're probably at a good place. So please, make sure you come back. Make sure you've gone over this again if you need help. And then after this class, or after this lecture, uh, just be prepared to explore some other ideas tied to this really budding, huge area of psychology that we call developmental psych. I'll see you then.